I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, too. Uh, you know, we haven't had any riddles lately, and I know a good one today. Well, quick, ask it of me. When is a door not a door? When is a door not a door? Mm -hmm. uh, when it's still a tree and not cut up? No, that's not the answer. Uh, when it's locked at night and can't be opened? No, that's not the answer. I give up. When is a door not a door? When it's a jar. <laughs> oh, that's very good. When a door is a little bit open, you call that being slightly a jar. <laughs> and a jar is also something you put applesauce in. And I like applesauce best when you put a little cinnamon in it. I like it best when it's in apple pie. How would you like it when it's apple jam? I, I love it if it's on raisin toast. And since raisin toast is never a jar, I'm sure you can have it. <laughs> All right. I'll take it just as soon as you read me the funny. Puck the comic weekly. <laughs> yeah. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <laughs> Beetle and a couple of his pals are in town enjoying themselves at bowling alley. Beetle's pal says, Are you ready to go, Beetle? You're first up. Beetle, who's over at the rack where the balls are stacked, says, I'm looking for that ball I had last week. One of the balls comes rolling back onto the rack and... Oh! Hits Beetle smack in the hand. And lucky that wasn't my ball in hand. Wish I could find my regular ball. Then last picture top row, he sees the ball he's looking for. But a girl on the other side of the rack has picked it up. Beetle exclaims, Hi, there it is. And he grabs the ball just as she throws it. She slips and falls as her arms come forward. And she slides all the way down the alley. And first picture bottom row hits the bowling pins head first. Beetle yells, Strike! The girl's boyfriend sees what happened. Second picture bottom row, he walks over. And he picks up Beetle. Hey, did I say something wrong? And throws Beetle down the bowling alley. Beetle skids last picture head first into the pins. Die! And last picture lands at the feet of the setup boy, who yells, I'm quitting! It was bad enough when they just threw balls! <laughs> Wasn't that funny? Oh. Sliding on his stomach all the way down the alley and hitting the balls with his head. It certainly was. That was some bowling game. Yes, those army boys. Yes, those army boys. Well, now let's turn over the page and see what's happened to Prince Val. And here he is on page three. And last week, little Prince Zion went hunting. I wonder what happens today. Well, we'll find out right now. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> It's been rather quiet at Val's home lately, but today it's different. A dragon ship has come into the fjord and makes fast. It's Val's friend, Voltar, the Sea King, the great fighter, home from far coast with plunder for all. Hello, In no time at all, first picture, second row, Voltar's at the castle, greeting his wife, Tilikum, with a rib-cracking hug as Val and Alita and little Prince Arn look on. His shouts of joy and delight at being back can even be heard by the watchman in the tower and the wine keeper in the vaults way down low in the castle. Boltar wants Tillicum to go home with him. After all, she's his wife, but also she's little Arn's nurse, and she wants little Arn to come along with her. Val finally consents to let little Arn go along, and Arn wants to because he considers Boltar the loudest hero in the world. <laughs> and then it's settled. Last picture, second row, Boltar roars, Come, little chicken, away we go! <laughs> Boltar.
Boltar's men smiled to see him now quietly coming from the castle, first picture bottom row, with his wife and little Prince Arn, looking a little bashful. He has many friends, and his men would follow him to the ends of the earth. But Boltar also has enemies who hate him with equal enthusiasm. And when his enemies learn that Prince Arn is a guest in Boltar's house, last picture they gather to plot a shameful scheme to discredit Boltar with the king. I really don't know what they plan to do with him. But they're making these evil plans just because Boltar has little Prince Arn. Yes, I know, because they want to make it look as though Boltar doesn't take good care of little Arn. My, I wonder what they will do. Next week, we'll find out more about this, and I hope it won't be anything bad. Oh, so do I. Well, now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, there's my favorite, favorite, Donald Duck. And we'll read that right away. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze jump, squeeze jump, squiddly chicka track. Let's have music to fit in. Quack, quack. Donald sees a sign in a toy shop downtown. Target pistol, absolutely harmless. Won't even break a light bulb. Only two and a half dollars. Donald exclaims, My, my, a harmless toy for the boy. Then by the time you can go, Donald is home with a new toy gun, and he says, uh, I better test it before I give it to the boy. Last picture top row, he points the pistol at his neighbor's window and pulls the trigger. Uh-oh. First picture, bottom row, he sees his neighbor's window completely shattered. Donald exclaims, Well, guess there's nothing to do but fess up and pay off. So he rings his neighbor's doorbell. Ah, uh, Mr. Jones, sir, I accidentally broke your window, and I'm here to pay for it. The neighbor reaches for the money. And your second childhood, buster, give me. A minute later, fourth picture bottom row, Donald is going back into his house, looking very sad. His three nephews peek around the corner with an anxious look in their eyes. As he goes into the house, they hear Donald say, Not even a light bulb, they said. Last picture, his three nephews ring Mr. Jones' doorbell. Yeah? And Louis says to Mr. Jones, Hey, Mr. Jones! Does there happen to be a baseball in your front room? Oh, oh, I, I bet you I know what happened. I think I do, too. Uh, just as Donald pulled the trigger of the new little toy pistol, the boys had hit a ball and it crashed through Mr. Jones' window. And Donald thought it was his gun that had broken the window. <laughs> yes, I wonder if he'll ever find out that it was his nephew. I wonder, too. Well, now look across the page. Oh, there's Roy Rogers. And you remember, Royce found out that Sam Teal was the man who'd been smuggling the gold dust from the government Indian reservation. Yes, he learned that Sam put the gold dust in a hollow spoke of the wheel of the stagecoach. And so he's gone along on the stagecoach to guard it. And you remember last week, the stagecoach was held up by an outlaw named Hepin Hobbs. He's after the gold. I wonder if he will get it. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo. <laughs> Hairpin Hobbs forces Roy at the point of a gun to remove the spoke with the gold dust in it from the wagon. Roy hands it to Hobbs. Hairpin makes sure the gold dust is there, pours some of it into his hand, and then exclaims, Yeah, beautiful stuff in it. Sort of evens me up with Till for him trying to plug me. At this moment, a passenger in the stagecoach quickly slips behind Hairpin and drops to his hands and knees behind him. Quickly, Roy leaps at Hairpin and pushes him against the passenger. Hairpin trips over the customer and falls to the ground, dropping his gun. Roy exclaims, Well, I was quick thinking, mister, thanks. Last picture top row, as the driver brings a rope to tie up Hairpin, Roy says, Smart enough to give Hairpin Hobbs a free stage ride to jail and saddle gap. I'll take that gun, mister. Meantime, Sam Teal has arrived at the stagecoach delivery station where he means to intercept the stagecoach and get Roy. The sheriff's office happens to be next door to the livery stable. But the sheriff has gone off and left the office in charge of a man named Denver, who is one of Sam Teal's crooked partners. Second picture, bottom row, Sam is telling Denver. 
Yeah, a meddling cowpoke named Roy Rogers is headed out here to find out who receives the gold I secretly ship out on the stages. Denver nervously exclaims, Oh, hey, that means he'll nab me. I don't hanker for a stretch in Dale. I'm leaving. Sam pulls a gun. No, you don't. You're helping me recover that dust from the stage and get rid of Rogers. That moment, last picture, the stagecoach drives up. Roy reins in in front of the sheriff's office and calls to the driver. All right, keep an eye on Happy and Hobbs, driver. I'll fetch the sheriff. Oh, my. Roy's going to come into the sheriff's office, and he won't be looking for trouble because he will expect to find the sheriff there, and Sam Keel might shoot him dead. Yes, that could happen. Well, I wish the sheriff would hurry and come back just now because Roy surely needs him. Yes, Roy could use some help right now. Do you think the sheriff will come back? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now let's turn over the page and see what we can find. All right. Oh, look, on the last page of the first section, there's Dick's adventures. And you remember, Dick is in the early days of America, and he's joined the American Navy under that handsome young lieutenant named Oliver Perry. Yes, Oliver Perry has been appointed to command the United States Navy and sweep the British off Lake Erie. Yes, because America was at war with England at that time, and the British have all kinds of ships on Lake Erie. But when Oliver Perry and Dick got to Lake Erie, they found out that there weren't any American ships at all, and so they have to build their own navy. And last week, they began to build their own ships. But I wonder if they'll build them in time to beat the British. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventure. Say the magic words with me. Riggity pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. On the shore of Lake Erie, the hard-working Americans speed the building of their ships, hidden by the wilderness. Three gunboats and two brigs, last picture, top row, begin to take shape. But the going is slow, and time is important. Perry's greatest problem is manpower. Many men are needed to build the ships, but though new recruits do arrive and report in to Dick, first picture, second row, men from far off Norfolk, New York, and Boston, they come so slowly there's only a trickle of Navy shipwrights, sailors, and guns into the strange far-off naval outpost. Many, many more are needed. Always there's the worry of the British finding out what the Americans are up to. And on the sandbar, commanding the view of the lake, sentries, second picture, second roll, keep a sharp lookout for the British fleet. But the British have sharp-eyed spies. Last picture, second row, Indians in the forest watch the Americans at work. And first picture bottom row at the friendly town of Detroit, captured by the British. The Indians report to the British captain every day and tell him of Perry's secret plan. Then suddenly at dawn, a few days later, last picture comes the dreaded moment. British man of war ships! The shout electrifies the camp. To your guns! Dick's warning sends the whole encampment to protect Perry's half-built fleet, which stands high and dry and defenseless. Americans are doing. Yes, it is, because if the Americans cannot finish building the ships, they'll have no way of fighting the British Navy. Oh, and the British can turn their cannon on the ships uh, that are still standing there on land, and they can blow them to pieces. Yes, there is that danger, or the Indians might slip into camp and burn them. Oh, my. Why, what do you think will happen? Well, we'll find out next week. But now look below, Dick's Adventures. There's Rusty Riley, and I'll read him in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, at the bottom of the page, Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. It's only one day before the Blue Brook Handicap race is to be run. The race which Rusty has entered his horse, Space Pilot, in, hoping to win the $1,000 to give to Mrs. Jones to keep her from losing her farm to the crooked Mr. Marlowe. Rusty had met an unusual character named Stovepipe, who had told him that his horse needed different shoes if he was going to win the race. So they've taken the horse to a blacksmith, who has changed the horse's shoes. And then he tells Rusty the charge is $20. Rusty doesn't have the money. 
The blacksmith says he won't let him take space pilot away until he gets his $20. Second picture top row, Rusty exclaims, Gee whiz, this is awful. We just got to win that race or Nell and her mother will lose their home. Oh, golly, if Tex was only here. Stovepipe answers, I feel that I am responsible for this predicament. Therefore, I shall temporarily accept the offer of my old friend, Denver Dooley. Some hours later that afternoon, first picture, bottom row, the blacksmith says to the boys, I'm sorry, kids, but if the old gent don't come back soon, I'll have to lock up for the night. I got a date for a ball game. Rusty answers, oh, Golly, we can't leave Space Pilot here all night. The race is tomorrow. Give us a half an hour. We'll go to the fairgrounds and get him. As the boys near the fairgrounds, Pete says, Hey, Rusty, what did Mr. Stovepipe say? You know, you know when he said about being a disciple of hippo, a uh, hippo, well, that hippo is something, you're, what did he mean? Rusty answers, Oh, Hippocrates. Well, that's fancy talk for a doctor. I heard it on the radio once. The boys get to the fairgrounds, and they make a quick search. Last picture, Rusty suddenly exclaims, Hey, Jiggers, there he is. Pete looks up and sees their friend Stovepipe up on a platform beside an Indian in full regalia. And there's a big sign in front of them which says, Ramapo Snake Oil, Nature's Wonder Drug. And they hear Stovepipe speaking to the crowd. And my friends, before my assistants pass among you with this wonder-working panacea, I ask you to observe the radiant health of Chief Little Hawk, the discoverer of Ramapo snake oil. And Pete says, So that's what a disciple of Hippocrates is. <laughs> Stovepipe would go off to the county fair and try to help Rusty raise the money to pay for the horse's shoes? Yes, you figured, and I think it's wonderful that he has. I've been to county fairs, too, and I've seen men doing just what Stovepipe's doing. But I never had any of that snake oil, have you? Oh, no, no. I don't think I've ever needed it. That Indian looks awfully healthy. Yes, he does. But then you do, too. Well, thank you. I hope the stovepipe sells enough of that snake oil to get the $20 to pay for the horse's shoes. Well, so do I, and we'll find out next week if he does. Now let's pick up the first page of the second section. Oh, yes, and see what funny thing Dagwood does today. So here we go on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly with Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Ram a food, am a fum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie says to Dagwood, Mr. Schrader's sick, and I made this pot of soup for him. Oh, I- I'll take it over there. <laughs> A moment later, Dagwood is in Mrs. Schrader's kitchen and has handed her the pot of soup. Just then, Mrs. Schrader's doorbell rings. Dagwood says to her, Oh, I'll answer it, Mrs. Schrader. You take the soup up to your husband. So last picture, top row, Dagwood opens Mrs. Schrader's door. And a traveling salesman says... Uh, I'm selling can openers. May I speak to your wife? Dagwood answers, Well, she's busy. She can't come to the door now. And then Dagwood goes upstairs and finds Mr. Schrader enjoying his soup. And Mr. Schrader says, Uh, thank Blondie. For me, Dagwood. This soup is delicious. A moment later, Dagwood is at home. Last picture, second row. And he's reporting to Blondie. The Schraders send their thanks, Blondie. Just then, the doorbell rings. Dagwood, see who's at our front door. I have to go down to the laundry. Okay. So Dagwood goes to the front door. First picture, next row. And there's the salesman he saw at the Schrader house. And the salesman says, Uh, I'm selling can openers. May I speak to your wife? Dagwood answers, Well, she's busy. She can't come to the door now. Outside on the doorstep, the salesman who has just come from the Schrader's house, where Dagwood had just come to the door, suddenly goes, I'm positive that's the same guy who told me his wife was busy up the street. He turns around and begins to pound on Dagwood's door. Mega mist! Mega mist! Inside the house, first picture bottom row, Dagwood exclaims, Great Scott, the whole neighborhood will hear him! He dashes to the door. Begumist, I'll report you to the police. I'll be 
Shh, shh, shh. Be quiet, please. Be quiet. I, I promise to buy all your can openers if you'll be quiet. Last picture. Dagwood comes in the house, his arms filled with can openers. Blondie says... Why did he call you a bigamist? Dagwood snarls... I guess because I got so many can openers. <laughs> oh, oh, poor oh. Dagwood. After being so nice trying to do that favor for Mrs. Schrader, he gets into all this trouble. Yes, and he has to buy all of those can openers. <laughs> now he can use them for Christmas presents or else try to sell them himself. Say, you're a smart little girl. Yes, I am, I like. Yes, you are. Well, now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, there's Robin Hood. Yes, Robin Hood. Oh, and you remember last week, the lovely maid Marion had come out to Sherwood Forest, and, and she told Robin Hood and his men that King John had said that Robin Hood was not loyal to King Richard. And Robin Hood and his men were very angry. And when Marion told them that King Richard was held a prisoner in a far-off country and could not be freed unless lots of ransom money was paid for him, Robin Hood and his men gave Marion every cent they had and told her to take it to the queen to help free the king. And that should show up, Prince John. I wonder if Maid Marion will get back safely with that money. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's merry, merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. Some music. Hi-ho! <laughs> Maid Marion, escorted by Friar Tuck, who is one of Robin Hood's friends, arrives safely at Nottingham. She comes into the square where she finds a huge crowd. On the steps of the castle sits the Queen, the Cardinal, and Prince John. In front of them is a table, and standing beside it is the Sheriff of Nottingham, who hates Robin Hood and who is Prince John's friend. This special occasion has been set aside so the people can donate money to buy King Richard's freedom. The Maid Marion comes to the table places on it a huge sack of coins, telling the queen, this is money given by Robin Hood and his men to prove their loyalty to the king. Last picture, top row. One of the men in the crowd shouts, Now where is your gift, Sir Sheriff? First picture, bottom row, another shouts, Oi, a thousand marks from the sheriff! <laughs> As the crowd shouts for the sheriff to prove his loyalty to King Richard by donating a thousand marks, Robin Hood and two of his men slip into the sheriff's house. They overpower the sheriff's servants. <coughs> All right, men, tie them up. I'll open the vault. And then they fill a chest with the sheriff's hoard of money, which he's gotten by taxing the poor people of the kingdom. And a short time later, they make their way through the crowd. They see the sheriff hold up his hand. They see the people quiet down and hear the sheriff say, I would to heaven I could give ten times that amount for my king, but... The sheriff stops in astonishment, for he sees, last picture, Robin and his men, still in disguise, come to the table carrying a chest filled with boxes of money and jewelry, a chest that he knows is his. And Robin says, Heaven has heard your plea, O Lord High Sheriff. Hey, look! The sheriff's money, and he said he was poor! Oh! oh, hooray, hooray for Robin. He fixed that sheriff good. Yes, you bet it looks like he did, bringing the sheriff's money there just at the time when the sheriff was trying to say he didn't have any money. <laughs> and the sheriff can't take it back now, can Not he? in front of those people he can't. <laughs> Ten times more. Yes, and that could make a lot more trouble for Robin Hood. Well, now let's go across the page and see who's there. Oh, Flash Gordon. And you remember last week, Flash was afraid that that space ship that they were in would crash into the sun. And Flash was afraid they'd all be killed. But he got away all right. Yes, he escaped just in time from crashing into the sun. And he zoomed off in another direction. But this time, his spaceship crashed into the sea on the planet Venus. Yes, but... After it crashed in the sea uh, around there, uh, Venus there, wouldn't the ship probably sink? Yes, there's great danger of that. Well, quick read and let's see what happens. Very well. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga, riga, doon, doon, saskamatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Trapped when the sealed space sphere crashes into the sea on the planet Venus, Dale has a moment's panic 
as she realizes their ship is sinking in the strange, oily morass that surrounds them. Flash realizes they'll have to quickly get out of their ship, which is sealed tight. So using the flame gun as a torch, Flash hastily carves a section out of the ship's hull. He says, to make some paddles, too. And if this section will float, we'll use it as a light raft and row ashore. Last picture top row, they barely launch their makeshift boat before the spaceship sinks. But their paddling makes little headway in the queer, clinging liquid. Zarkov says, well, This isn't water. It's more like melted rubber or some silicon oil. Hey, don't, don't fall overboard. We couldn't swim in this sticky stuff. Suddenly, first picture bottom row, they discover what kind of creatures can swim in a Venusian sea. Surfacing nearby, a swarm of fishmen head for the castaways in an obvious attempt to capture them. Hoping to frighten off the planet's strange, hostile natives, Flash fires a warning shot with his flame gun. But when the fireboat hits the Silicon Sea, the explosion rocks his little ship, nearly dumping him overboard. And then Flash has an idea. He decides to use his rocket pistol as a jet to drive the ship forward. So last picture, he braces the flame gun against the stern of the boat, then turns on the heat. And the boat goes forward like a speedboat. As they roar off, Flash shouts, Hang on, everybody! Oh, look, he's getting away from those strange creatures that came out of the sea. Yes, he's getting away, but I wonder for how long. Yes, and where will he go? I don't see land anywhere. Neither do I. I'm worried. Will that rocket pistol keep going long enough to get them food and and be safe? We'll find that out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tony Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>